I'm Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue. I'm a cardiologist at Brigham Women's Hospital and I'm reporting for Medscape. Joining me today is Dr. Stephen Nichols. He's a professor of cardiology at Monash University in Australia. Welcome. Thanks. So he's really a, a world expert on the field in general of, of lipid therapies. Um, but one evolving area that we're learning more and more about is this concept of lipoprotein little a and the role it may play in heart disease. So let's maybe just start there and think about the evidence that we have in terms of lipoprotein little a and its potential role in heart disease, cardiovascular disease more broadly. So we've known about LP little a since the early 60s. If you think about it, when most of us did our training, LP little a was one of those quirky risk factors that you'd occasionally measure when somebody had an MI and you couldn't understand why they were there. Uh, but, but in recent years, we understand a lot more about the biology, biology the genetics of LP little a. Uh, we, we've seen large population studies show us that high LP little a not only associates with a higher rate of ASCVD, MI and stroke, but actually also associates with a higher risk of aortic valve disease. And uh, the genetic studies have then layered on top of that uh, that really suggests that LP little a plays a causal role, particularly in those disease processes. And so a lot more interest in LP little a, which then leads to the question of can we develop therapies that will target it? Yeah, because I think that that's been one of the interesting points is that um, people have debated, you know, when is it appropriate to measure an LP little a in somebody? Because currently it, it is believed to be a good marker of risk. And yet the typical therapies that we reach for, such as statin therapies, do not actually lower LP little a. And so it's been unclear whether or not um, that is a reasonable strategy to help mitigate risk. Yeah, and I think traditionally the guidelines have said, well, perhaps it helps stratify somebody to more intensive lipid lowering. And so while statins don't lower LP little a, and they may in fact raise it a little bit, uh, they're really good at lowering LDL cholesterol. And so today, uh, if you've got somebody who you think's high risk, particularly if they've got a high LP little a, lowering their LDL cholesterol seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do, which is what the guidelines have told us to do. So you raise an interesting point. I mean, we know that the PCSK9 inhibitors do in fact lower LP little a concentration, unlike the statins. So I suppose in your practice, if you had a patient with a high LP little a, in the absence of some of these newer therapies that are in development to, to directly lower LP little a concentration, do you currently risk currently reach for a PCSK9 inhibitor? So in my country, it's a bit, a bit challenging in terms of who can access the PCSK9 inhibitor. Uh, but I, I think that's compelling data. I think that both PCSK9 inhibitor trials show us that LP little a lowering does associate with some of the benefit. Now, these are really good LDL cholesterol lowering drugs. Uh, um, but I think if there's somebody who you think is higher risk, particularly if they've got a high LP little a, then I think it's a, a reasonable strategy to think about. And what are your thoughts on apheresis? There have been some countries that are quite enthusiastically bracing, embracing um, uh, apheresis uh, as a potential strategy for managing those with high LP little a concentrations, but, but what do you think about the evidence there? Well, I, I, I think that it's been the only real option for a long time, and particularly for patients who have got sky-high LP little a's. Uh, these patients are really worried. They, they read the literature, they know that they're at a risk, and they know that there haven't really been a lot of options in the past. I think for the same kind of reasons that the PCSK9 inhibitors have changed the whole landscape for patients with FH or familial hypercholesterolemia, far less of them need apheresis. I think we're trying to identify can we have better strategies to treat high LP little a? Because apheresis is a, is a highly invasive process. And I think that we would prefer our patients not to be having that. Yeah. So let's think about the, the therapies that are in development now that, that directly lower LP little a concentration. Because, you know, I think when it came to the PCSK9 inhibitors, it's always been hard to know how much of the benefit of PCSK9 inhibition is actually through LDL reduction versus its effects on lowering LP little a. But now with these novel therapeutics in development, they, they really just lower LP little a concentration primarily alone, albeit there, there are some effects on, on LDL cholesterol, mm -hmm. but some of that appears to be just carried along with, um, with the fact that LDL um, is bound to um, bound up in LP little a as well. Yeah, well, they become the one trick pony, but actually that's what we've been wanting. Uh, and, and so now we have multiple development programs. We've got anti-sense therapy, uh, we have uh, RNA inhibitory 
uh, approaches and there's a number of them and we've got data being presented uh, here at the AHA that you're leading uh, with, with another one of those therapeutics. And, and, and these therapies look really impressive in terms of their ability not just to lower ALP a little A but lower it a lot. And so now we're moving away from having had therapies that can't lower ALP a little A to PCSK9 inhibitors that can lower it 30%. So now having a range of therapeutics that can lower at 80, 90, potentially even close to 100% lowering of LP little a, and, 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 and that's a really exciting time in this field. Uh, these agents look like they work really well. They appear to be in general pretty well tolerated in the short studies that have been done to date. And now the next question will be, will they lower risk? Right, no, exactly. And to that point, I think that one of the areas of controversy remains how large of a reduction in LP little a will we need to see in order for that to translate into meaningful clinical um, uh, risk reduction? Um, and so do you have any thoughts there and, and whether or not we really should be studying exclusively those with, with higher LP little a concentrations at this stage? Well, the genetic studies, I think, um, alarmed us a bit. While they showed us that having high LP little a was causal from an atherosclerotic perspective, they almost imply that you'd need to lower LP little a at least 100 milligrams per deciliter uh, to, to find that a comparable degree of risk reduction that you'd see in LDL cholesterol lowering trials. Um, that then makes this a therapeutic that's really only gonna be useful for a very, very small number of people. Mm. It's gonna make those trials very difficult. Um, I think most of us active in this field have kind of hoped that we wouldn't need as much LP little a lowering. Uh, and, and, and I think that when you get into higher risk patients, particularly those who have got clinically manifest disease, they may have additional risk factors, whether it's hypertension, diabetes, raised CRP, for example, um, that relationship between LP little a and subsequent risk seems much tighter. And so mm -hmm. it, I think that gives us hope that we can be enrolling patients in these big trials with, LD, with LP little a's that may be above 70 milligrams per deciliter or something like that, um, many more patients can get into those trials. Um, we think that that will be a good starting point for what these trials should be looking at um, and then would potentially then be a, a useful therapeutic for a lot of people. No, and I, I think that as you make these points, it's akin very much to where statin therapies originally started, where we really looked at those with very high LDL cholesterol level concentrations at baseline. But as the field has continued to evolve, and understanding the shape of the relationship is, is largely uh, you know, linear, log linear in the case of, of LP little a, in terms of res risk and not a clear threshold existing, yeah. there's no reason to think that um, you wouldn't continue to have uh, benefit even for those who are lower um, at a lower starting baseline concentration of LP little a in terms of further reducing that risk as you go along. Exactly, and, 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 and exactly the same kind of concept in terms of whether primary or secondary prevention. I, yeah. If these work, they're likely to work in everybody who's at some degree of risk, and you would imagine that people are at a higher risk, that that risk is probably more modifiable. But we have to start these clinical trials somewhere. And, and, you, and the statin example is, is a really great example. For us, had uh, 4,400 patients. Um, you think about it, we're doing PCSK9 inhibitor trials with okay. 27,000. Uh, um, and uh, so starting in high risk patients is always a useful place to start. They have the greatest, quote, unmet need. Um, uh, but if we show that they work here, then you can imagine a series of trials over the course of the next 10, 15 years that we'll look at it in a whole range of different clinical settings. Absolutely, and, and one of those settings, as my last question, might be aortic stenosis. You, you raised this yourself, that we uh, know based on the Mendelian randomization data that it seems like LP little a plays a causal role there, and yet we don't currently have any therapies that help to slow progression of, of aortic stenosis. So do you think that that is a promising space as well? I think it's a promising space. I think most of us are struggling to try and understand what those clinical trials will look like. And, mm -hmm. and again, how early in the disease process, if you take somebody whose cal valves too calcified, has, has the, kind of the horse bolted out of the barn and are you trying to target a biology that's a little earlier on? But wouldn't it be exciting if 10 years from now, we can think about a complete game change to aortic stenosis, that you've got 
two different stages in the course of the disease where you can bring new technologies to completely change the way, the way that we treat. You can have a biologic that targets LP little a early, arrests progression. And for those people who are much more advanced, we can now replace their valve on a tip of the catheter. And you know, you get to a point where we eliminate major cardiac surgery uh, for, for a disease where that was the only thing that we could do for decades. Yeah, no, I think it's a very exciting, promising space. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to see where things evolve and certainly the phase three studies will um, give us the definitive answer. Everybody. So thank you again for joining me today. Thanks. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.